in Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, it says this. So he, speaking of Jesus, he got in a boat and he crossed over and he came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins... Then he said to the paralytic, Arise and take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and he departed to his house. And now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and they glorified God who had given such power to men. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And so he arose and he followed him. And now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. You may be seated. This morning, we're going to take a look at these two accounts. These two accounts are written for us and given to us as it flows from Jesus' introduction to this world of the kingdom of heaven. That's really what the, the book of Matthew is about. It's about the introduction of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is coming into a worldly kingdom and talking about a heavenly kingdom. And Jesus is the king over that heavenly kingdom. And you may re remember when Jesus was crucified, they mockingly wrote over his head on a sign, King of the Jews, mockingly. But in reality, what they didn't really understand was that Jesus was the King of Kings. And Jesus is the Lord of Lords. Jesus is over all, in all, and through all. And Jesus is introducing this. And as he does that, he talks about these attitudes and these characteristics of someone that's in the kingdom of heaven. And that's the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. As he talks about the Beatitudes, he transitions from the Beatitudes into a, 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 a sermon speaking about the different things in the kingdom of heaven. But, but the key is to understand that Jesus says, as he's talking about his kingdom, he says, be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. And he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which by the law were the most religious people around, then you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus was laying out was the reality and the fact that no one can get to God, no one can get to heaven by themselves. No one could be perfect. No one can have the righteousness required to be with God. And so as Jesus is laying this out, then he transitions and begins to perform miracles. And the reason he does that is Jesus is demonstrating through these miracles his power to do what we can't do. He's showing that he truly has authority over demons, over the natural realm, over the wind and the waves, over people who are sick, over lepers, over that Jesus had all authority. That's what he's doing in the miracles. And now as he continues this sort of miracle ministry, 
And remember, these miracles were done by him to demonstrate who he was and his ability. And that translates to us saying that through him, not of ourselves, but through him, all things are possible. That we can't run the Christian race in our own strength. We can't even enter into the presence of God on our own. It has to be through Jesus Christ. So he, he proved his authority. And he's doing that in all these different ways to, to show, to show that, that he has authority over everything. And so as we get to chapter 9, what we're seeing is we're going to look at two individuals that are helpless and hopeless because of their sin. And this is a condition where Jesus is saying that, that because of their sin, that they have become helpless and hopeless, but Jesus has overcome their sin and he has restored us in himself giving hope to anybody who feels helpless and hopeless. How does that happen? It happens through His forgiveness. And that's what this is all about this morning. This is uh, divine forgiveness. This is not a message about, you know, forgiving one another, which is important. But we can't even forgive one another unless we have the forgiveness of God. Not truly forgive, like a biblical forgiveness. The Bible says in Psalm 32, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Have you ever really considered that? Have you ever really took time to meditate on the fact that if you're, if you're truly a Christian here, Today, you are, you're forgiven. You're so forgiven. A Christian is so forgiven that the Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 8, he says, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, one of the most amazing things, you think about it, so many people carry around guilt and shame and condemnation. They live like that. Regret. They wish they hadn't have done this and they wish they hadn't have done that and they live like that. Sometimes even as, as Christians we live like that because we don't understand how forgiven we really are. How forgiven are we? The depths of our forgiveness can't be measured. And so you may be here and you may be able to say, you know, this is wrong and, and I wish this wasn't like this and I wish this wasn't like that. But you know what? If you're a Christian, you're the most blessed person on the face of the earth. You have what can't be bought. You have the forgiveness of sins. And that forgiveness extends for the rest of eternity, not just now. That you are forgiven of your past, you're forgiven of your present and you're forgiven of your future by one act of Jesus Christ. Now, is it important to, to really understand how forgiven we are? I believe it is. Because the Bible says, he who is forgiven much, what? Loves much. He who is forgiven much, loves much. Now, that doesn't mean some people are forgiven more than other people. Because we're all sinners. Saved by grace. No, you know what it means? Some people realize how much they're forgiven more than other people. Do you realize how much you're forgiven today? You, you know, if you realize that, meditate upon it, you know what? You'll love God so much. You know, a person that kind of loves God, they don't understand how much they've been forgiven. It's the one who understands how much they've been forgiven. So I want to look at that this morning in this text. The, the message this morning is just called Forgiven. And I hope and pray as we go through this that, that this understanding of your forgiveness 
will resonate with you. And I pray that this wouldn't just, you know, be some information you get, but that you would truly get a hold of this in your heart. And that's what the Holy Spirit has to do this. The Holy Spirit has to get a hold of your heart for you to realize, to almost to reveal it to you, to open your eyes so that the, the depth of His forgiveness will, will really drive your life. This is what we're driven by, that we're forgiven people. You may have heard the saying, I hate using cliche-ish Christian sayings, but Christians aren't perfect, they're what? Just forgiven. Christians aren't perfect, they're forgiven. I really want us as Christians to act like we're the most forgiven people, not the most perfect people. That's different, isn't it? We're so forgiven. How forgiven are we? You're supposed to say it. No. <laughs> so let's take a look at the text. And we're just going to kind of draw some stuff out of here and see if we can apply it to our lives. So number one, if you're taking notes, and the title of the message is just Forgiven. So we're going to look at helpless and hopeless. Number one is helpless. This is a, the paralytic, a guy who couldn't move, basically. So look, notice in verse one. So it says Jesus, so Jesus got into a boat and he crossed over. Jesus had been very active in ministry. Read chapter eight tonight for homework. And now he comes to his own city. And if you go to Israel with us, you'll go here. He comes to his own city, Capernaum. This is kind of his hometown, his home base. This is where Peter lived. And it says, then, behold, they brought him a paralytic lying on a bed. So, in Mark and Luke, we get a little more detail about that. So what happened was, when Jesus came into Capernaum, he went into a house, and he began to teach. And that house got so full of people, there wasn't room anymore. But there's a, a paralytic guy, he's on a bed or a mat, and his friends got wind of the fact that Jesus is coming to town. And by this time, you know, Jesus had been healing a lot of people, doing a lot of miracles. And in the regions around the Lake of Galilee, there are all these little villages and cities. And in these villages and cities, they would get wind of, hey, there's a guy doing all these miracles. He's casting out demons. Right before this, Jesus was at a place called the Gadarenes. And, and there, that was a place known as a place of demon possession. That, the Gadarenes, it's called the Gadarenes because the tribe of Gad, G-A-D, they settled there, and the tribe of Gad was one of the tribes that didn't cross the Jordan to go in the Promised Land. They wanted to stay back, which is interesting, isn't it? They wanted to stay back. Anytime we stay back from fully following the Lord, it's not a good thing. So now they, they stayed back. They didn't cross over into the promised land like God had said to do. They stayed back. And as they stayed back, they became pig farmers. Is that a good thing for a Jew? Is it a good thing for a Jew to be a pig farmer? No. Very bad thing. Very bad. Not kosher. <laughs> Not kosher. So they're there. So... This, this place had gotten uh, demon possession. That's a whole other topic we can talk about at some point. But, but right now, so, so Jesus casts out demons there. These demons that, that had really entrenched themselves. He cast them into some pigs, and the pigs ran down a slope and, and died. But, so now, now Jesus is going to his hometown, and, and, and as he goes to his own city, people are getting wind of that. He's in, a room, he's in a house, he's, he's preaching and teaching, and the guy the, on the mat and his friends, they try to go to Jesus, but they couldn't, they couldn't get in the house. They didn't learn Christian charity, I guess, at that point. 
Nobody let him in. So his friends, you remember what he did? they did? They go to the roof, roof the rooftop, and they kind of dig a hole, and they lower him down. That's what happened. So in Matthew, we get to pick this up, and, and, and it says in verse 2, it says, Behold, they brought him a paralytic lying on a mat. So that was from the top down, digging a hole. And imagine being there in this house and you're hearing Jesus teach and you hear a little something in the ceiling and you think it's like a rat or ra raccoon or a possum or something. And, and then all of a sudden this guy comes down on a mat. And then, and then they're all standing there. What's going to happen? What is Jesus going to do? So it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I would think that his friends and the paralyzed guy would be like, I wasn't here to get my sins forgiven, I, I wanted to walk again. What are you talking about? What do you mean my sins are forgiven? But see, what Jesus is doing is he's, he's seeing the greater need. This, yeah, this guy physically was helpless. He had to be carried around everywhere he went. But see, this paralytic, it's really a picture of our spiritual condition before God, without God. Our spiritual condition is one of paralysis. We're bankrupt, we're empty, we can't do anything. So people who say, well, I'm not a Christian, but I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual. I'm from California. A lot of people in California are spiritual. And they have crystals and all different ways of being spiritual. But you know what? You can't really, really be, say it with me, spiritual. Unless you're born again. You know that? You, you may think you're what? Spiritual. But really, you're just fully in the flesh. You're doing your own thing. The only way to truly be spiritual <laughs> is to be born, get born of the Spirit. Do you know that when we're born into the world, we're not born of the Spirit? We're missing that. That's why Jesus says you must be what? Not spiritual. <laughs> you must be born again. John chapter 3, right? Why does Jesus say you must be born again? It's because we have to be born spiritually. And that doesn't happen naturally. That happens as an act of faith in God. That's how we become born again. We put our faith in God. When we put our faith in God, we're born spiritually. Now there's a, a part of us that we didn't have before that we have now, and that, that's the spiritual part of us. So as we're born spiritually, that's what's going on in our text. So Jesus, he sees this guy come through the roof, and, and what Jesus is recognizing is that his friends had faith in what Jesus can do. They had faith in who he was. And it was their faith in Jesus that Jesus then would recognize the deeper need that it would be no problem for him to, to heal him and make him walk. That's no problem for Jesus. But it, but it would be an even better thing that this helpless spiritual person would be healed spiritually. And so this is what Jesus is doing. I think it's important for us, especially if you're a Christian, to see the deeper need in life, in people. And that we would have enough faith, like the paralytic's friends, to carry people to Jesus Christ. To carry them to this hope that God has and this help that He has Provided in Jesus Christ. But watch this. So as this is going on, in verse 3, so 
In verse 3, this, uh, th th there's this discussion going on. It says in verse 3, it, And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. So it's interesting because the scribes, of course, they were the very religious people. And when I say religious, we're describing an outward conformance, uh, conformity, I should say, outward conformity to religious rules. They are good at that. But their goodness in that and their ability in that didn't make them born again. It didn't make them spiritual. They still weren't spiritual because they weren't born again, but they're keeping a lot of rules and laws. And it's, it's always interesting as we look at this, it's always interesting to, to understand that, that the power that is necessary in order for us to be right with God is not in man. We don't possess that power to be right with God. But see, the, the scribes, they're reasoning within themselves, so they're not even saying anything outwardly. Inwardly, they're like, seriously, this guy is saying, you know, just, what is he saying? But notice something interesting. They, they, they're reasoning inside themselves, they're thinking this, but they're saying he's blaspheming. What, what does that mean? Why are they saying that? Is it, has anybody ever told you Jesus never said he was God? People will say that. Jesus never said he was God. His whole ministry was proving that he was God. And those around him knew what he was saying. Because when he, when he would say your, your sins are forgiven, when he said that, they knew only God could do that. So now their, their radar detectors are going off. Like this, this, this guy is a blasphemer. So he's either God or he's a blasphemer, right? He can't be just a good person. or He's either God or a blasphemer. So as they're reasoning within themselves and thinking about this, look at verse 4. Jesus knowing their thoughts, which is interesting. So this, again, shows you the ability of of Jesus demonstrating his ability in so many different ways and saying, hey, I am God. And Jesus knew what they were thinking. And then he, he called it evil what they were thinking. He said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Have you ever thought about to deny Jesus as God is evil? You know how sometimes people say, well, you know, Jesus is on the same level as Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius and Joseph Smith. They're all religious leaders. They're all the same. That's evil to think that. Because you're denying the deity of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? You're denying his godness. That's what deity means, his godness. That Jesus didn't become a god. Jesus was always God. In fact, the difference is he's the creator and we're the creation. That's the difference. That makes all the difference. So because he's creator and we're creation, we fall under him. We must be subjected to him. It's only natural. He is greater than us. So to properly align ourselves under him is what's proper and right. And if we don't, and if we never do, nothing will ever be right until we align ourselves under our creator in submission to him and his will. If we don't do that, we're never aligned right. No matter how spiritual we may be. So watch this. So Jesus, knowing their thought, he says, why do you think evil in your hearts for which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say arise and walk? What Jesus was saying is anybody can say your sins are forgiven, right? So you can, after church, go to Brahms and knock yourself out and have like, I don't know, bag of burgers and follow it up with like a chocolate shake and 
And then you'd be so happy, you tell the guy, your sins are forgiven. And then you drive off, and the guy's like, what? <laughs> and then he's wondering, like, are my sins forgiven? Or what is that? Huh? Anybody can say that, and I don't recommend you say that. By the way, don't say that. But anybody can say that. But see, what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that anybody can say that, but I'm saying it as a different person than anybody else. He's separating himself from everybody else. And then now he's going to prove who he is and what he does. He's going to prove it by doing a miracle, a physical miracle. And this is why they came to him in the beginning. But Jesus wanted to prioritize and settle what was most important, and that's the salvation of our souls. So look in verse 6. I'm sorry, look, look in verse 5. He says, Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and walk? And so now he says, but that you may know. That's the key, that you may know. So I'm doing this miracle, I want you to know. I'm proving something. That the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. That's what he wanted them to know. I want you to know that I have, I have a power to forgive sin. And so, I want you to know this. So he says to the paralytic, he says, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose, and he departed to his house. And when the multitude saw it, they marveled, and they glorified God who had given such power to men. So what we see here now is when we're talking about being forgiven, like truly being forgiven, and the forgiveness that, that we all really need, the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing of our soul, in order to access that, we have to access that by faith. Right? So the Bible says it's not by our works or the things we do, but it's by our faith in what Jesus has done. So He has done it, that's why it's called grace, but we put our faith in it, and what happens is when we put our faith in, in Jesus Christ, who He is and what He's done, then we become born again. And why do we become born again? Because we're, we're putting our faith in what Jesus did and what He do. He forgave us of all of our sins. Why is that important? Because our sins are what kept us from Him. So He wiped away all of our sins. So, so Jesus is proving through the miracle of healing that now He actually has the power to do that. And wasn't that kind of what the scribe was, was questioning? Like, He's blaspheming, only God can forgive sin. And then He tells the guy to rise and walk, and the guy just skips home. And all the people are, are thinking, he must be God. He can forgive sins. Now, imagine yourself as that paralytic, completely powerless over your condition. Imagine yourself completely helpless, completely at the mercy of one that's greater. And, and there's one that you heard about that can give you hope. There's, there's one that has come and, and you think he might be able to heal your, your legs and make you walk, but then you find out that that one has more power than that. He actually has the, the power to forgive sin and only God can do that. Only God can forgive sin. Only God can born us in Christ. Only God can make us spiritual. And so now we have this first example of a completely helpless person walking. And that's a picture of a person completely helpless spiritually and then born again and now walking in the newness of life. If you're a believer here today, take a lot of time to meditate on what God has done for you. Take a lot of time to think about, to consider all the things that God has done in and through your life. In Ephesians, I'll give you a little example. In Ephesians 2, verse 4, 
It says, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. This is just an amazing thing. Sometimes as Christians, we spend a lot of our energy, we invest a lot of emotional and physical energy in worrying about things and stressing about things instead of praising and rejoicing in what we already have. We are the most blessed people on the face of the earth. Our sins have been forgiven. There's no money that can buy that. There's nobody else that can give that. And you and I, if you're truly a believer, you wake up every morning knowing your sins are completely washed away. Knowing that you are in completely good graces with Jesus Christ. Know, knowing that there's no more barrier between you and Jesus Christ. That you've been set free, washed clean, and pure in the eyes of God. What better is that? The next thing then, let's go... From helpless to hopeless. So now we have the story of the tax collector. So now look at verse 9. It says, so now Jesus passed from there. So now Jesus is moving on. And now he sees a man named Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said to Matthew, he said, follow me. And so Matthew arose and he followed Jesus. Seems simple enough, right? Now, you have to understand a little bit about the tax collector. The tax collector in those days, and Matthew, Matthew was the Jew. And how did the Jews feel about the Romans? Terrible. The Romans were really harsh and brutal on the Jews. And Matthew, a Jew, worked for the Romans. That's a pretty bad deal, huh? Not only did he work for the Romans, but being a tax collector, the way he made his living was collecting taxes for the Roman Empire, which was a lot of taxes. They levied a lot of taxes, kind of like California, a lot of taxes going on. But the way he made his money was extorting more money out of people. So they're already high tax rate then was taken to a whole nother level because the tax collectors would have to collect on top of the taxes their own fees. So a tax collector, everybody hated him. Matthew would be a guy that he wouldn't have a place to fit in. The, the Romans didn't like him, the Jews didn't like him. He would be an outcast. He would be a guy that um, people would probably want to spit on when they walked by. Have you ever had somebody look at you with a look of disdain and disgust? That's a terrible feeling if you ever have. I hope you never have. But if, you, if somebody just looked at you like they're disgusted with you. Every day, Matthew would experience this look of disgust. And people would say things about him, say things to him. And so his, his whole existence was pretty miserable. But see, what's interesting about that is, is Jesus, he had an eye for people like this. Isn't that interesting? Jesus had an eye and he had a, a heart string that was pulled in regards to people that were hopeless. And, and I, bet, I bet there was a, this feeling of hopelessness with Matthew. I bet Matthew just, just felt like looking forward in life, there's nothing for me. In fact, a recent study came out with uh, the elderly and how many elderly are taking their lives now because uh, either taking their lives or, or having severe depression because they can't, can't see anything good in the future for themselves. And so it brings about this huge depression. And so Matthew is probably a guy like that. And, you know, he'd get his money, but that, that would be it. And so Jesus cues in on that. And I want to encourage you that Oftentimes, the, the least likely people that we would think of, that we would think that they would never want to hear about God. They would never, never want to hear about Christ. Don't let your intellect get in the way of God's leading of the Holy Spirit. 
So as he's going, now Jesus is reaching. And as he's reaching and he's saying, follow me, it says he arose and followed him. I like the simplicity of that. Matthew, no doubt, he saw something in Jesus that in the other gospel account of this, it said he left all to follow him. So what, what, what Matthew was seeing in Jesus was he's seen, he seen hope embodied. He's, see, he's seen, you know, I don't, I don't really have anything to give me hope in this world, but here's a person that I can put my hope in. And, and he's he is willing to leave all and follow Jesus. And it was because of this, this hope that he saw in Jesus. And as he did that, as he followed Jesus, we, what we see is that there's this, this is how forgiveness works. Jesus reaches, but we have to respond, right? So Jesus can, can reach, but if we don't respond, then he's just reaching. John 3.16 you guys know that one? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, who's that? Believe in him, son, I perish, but have eternal life. Yes, that's it. <laughs> but, uh, but whoever, who does that include? Whoever. Whoever wants to. Yeah, we have to respond. He reaches. But we have to respond. But you know what? Here's the thing. So, if you're a Christian here, God's forgiveness has already reached you. And it's already been completed. And it's so important that you and I don't, don't live with guilt. Some of you right now are, are weighted down with guilt. You think, you know, if I would have done this with my kids, if, if I didn't do this with this, if I would have done this, and, and you live like that. And you know, when we live like that, we're not applying the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, which is total and complete. And so if that's you today, you're off the hook. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. Be responsible. But you don't have to feel guilty. It's actually, guilt is actually a sin that's not from the Lord. Condemnation is not from the Lord. Because Jesus' for, Jesus's forgiveness is complete. You know, you're free. Stop condemning yourself, or what I should say is stop letting Satan condemn you. That's a tool of the enemy to make you feel guilty, to, to paralyze you, to make you feel like, well, I can't, I can't serve the Lord. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Well, we all are. But we're forgiven, though. But we're forgiven. Don't forget that part. You remember the, the Easter part? Like the Sunday part? Don't, don't stay in Friday. Move on into this newness of life. So there's a reach and response. But, but this, this message of grace and forgiveness, it always comes with resistance. So this, this scribe is resisting it. And that's what Satan does. Satan wants us to have a works-based forgiveness. Like, I deserve to be forgiven because I've done some good stuff now. I should be forgiven. Satan doesn't like this free gift of grace that, that in Christ we are forgiven. And so we see this resistance. And lo notice in verse 11, it says, And when the, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors? Uh, and sinners. So what, what's happening here is, is Matthew had a dinner for all his friends. So he brought all his sinner friends over. Ooh. <laughs> he brought all his sin. You, you know what he was doing? He couldn't believe this Jesus and the hope. And he wanted all his friends to know this. He wanted all his, hey, come on over for dinner. I'm going to invite Jesus over. I, I met a guy, and there's something different about him. I think he's the Messiah. He's been healing people. He's been casting out 
demons. He's, he's fitting the description of what the Bible says the Messiah would be. Come on over and meet him. And do you think that invitation was one where somebody's like, I don't know if I want to go to Matthew's house. They are all coming. Because they, there was hope in Jesus. They, they couldn't find hope anywhere. So imagine them all gathered and all these sinners, you know, all these people, you know, just, just be careful. You don't get all weird about, you know, being in the world. Don't be of it, but be in it. We're not isolationists. You know, there's some movements in Christianity. Well, you know, things are getting tough. Let's stock up and move to the mountains till Jesus comes back. That's not biblical. Hey, we want to be two feet from the gates of hell, don't we? We want to be right in the place where the, the sinners are. Because we have the answer to their sins. If you have the antidote for cancer, you'd want to be in a cancer place. Right? We have the antidote to sin. So they, they invite him over. And the Pharisees didn't like that, that this was happening. That's what, that's what legalism always does. But look at verse 12. And we'll finish with this. So when, when Jesus heard what the Pharisees and the religious people were saying about, you know, don't, don't be near anybody who's a sinner, which... Ironically, the Pharisees and the religious people were the worst of sinners because they are self-righteous. So when Jesus heard, heard what they were saying, he said to them, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? To repentance. And that's the thing. For the hopeless. For the hopeless to come into a place where God is not requiring people to do a whole bunch of stuff. Lord, I sacrifice all this stuff and, and I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm giving to charities. I'm, I'm you know, going to church. I do all this. And Jesus, that's not what He requires. He requires that we receive His free gift of salvation. And then that we would walk in that. And so, do we really understand today how forgiven we are? So if, if you're a believer today, here's a good exercise for the week. Write down somewhere that you can see it constantly, Forgiven. Think about that. Meditate upon it. Live as a forgiven people, a person that there's no more condemnation. Walk in the newness of life and the power of God and move beyond condemnation and guilt so that now you can be a minister of forgiveness to those who are, who are stuck in the mud of unforgiveness. You see, if, if we can't break away and apply our own forgiveness in Christ, it's hard for us to minister the forgiveness of Christ to other people. So if you're a Christian, the greatest thing about us is that we're forgiven. And now that we're forgiven, we're free to love God and love other people. But you know, you may be sitting here and you may think, that you're good with God and right with God by the things you do. And I want to tell you, if that's what you think, you're not right with God. Because the only way to be right with God is to accept what He has done for you. It's not what we do, it's what He has done. So let me ask you this question. Let's just take everything off the table, clear blank slate, and ask yourself, have I been forgiven? Have I been forgiven? The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we all need to be forgiven. We've all sinned. And the Bible says that the penalty or wages of sin is death or separation from God now and for all eternity. But God demonstrated His love for us that while we were still sinners, what happened? 
Christ died for us. He's done it all. All to Him we owe. So John, what do I do? He's done it all now. It's a matter of putting your faith in Him. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ to be born again? Are your sins completely washed away and forgiven in Jesus Christ? If not, I'm going to give you that opportunity to do that today. Let's all stand. Bring the worship group up. Now, as we, uh, as we worship the Lord, I just want to, I want to pray. And I really want to pray for two things just before we go. And uh, when I pray, I'm going to first pray for anybody that's, that's really having a hard time just moving away from the, just the guilt and the condemnation and, and somebody who's just not free in Christ. Maybe you're a believer and just, you're not free in Christ. You still have this struggle with the world, with your sin. You still are just kind of caught in between two worlds. Many here know that struggle. And I remember Elijah when he had that battle on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18 with the, the priests of Baal. And, and, and he said, if God's truly God, the God of the Jews, the God of Israel, if he's truly God, then worship him. If he's not, then worship your God. A lot of us here are trying to do both. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you, that won't work. Many here have struggled with that for years and years until they finally said, I'm done with that. Are you really done with your life? Are you really ready to surrender your life to the will of God fully and completely and then watch what He will do? If He's Creator... There's nowhere else to go from that. Because you're the creation. I'm the creation. And I want to encourage you. I first want to pray for, for anybody here who would just say, you know what, I'm, fine. I'm, just, I'm just done with myself. I'm done with my will. I'm done with my thing. And today, I'm just going to lay my life down and say, here I am, Lord. It's as simple as that. So I want to pray for you if that's you. And, and if it is you, just acknowledge that in your heart before the Lord and just say, you know, that's what I want. Lord, I'm telling you, I, I, want, I just want your will. It's not about me anymore. I'm the problem. I just lay it all down. And just, so I want to pray for you, but then I'm also going to pray for anybody here that if you were to die today, you wouldn't be sure where you would end up. That's a real heavy thing. That's something that for every believer and and for me it's a, a heavy burden to think that there might be somebody in this room that won't go to heaven when they die so I want to pray for anybody here that doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ anybody here that's not born again anybody here that would say you know what I want my sins forgiven I want to go to heaven. I want to know God. Now's the time. I want to pray for you. So while we're standing, let's just all pray. And uh, whatever your thing is, just acknowledge that before the Lord. Maybe I could have Rob and Val come up right now. and just They'll be up here to pray for anybody that would like to come forward. But let's just pray together as a body of Christ. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that we're forgiven. And Lord, I first want to, want to pray for... For anybody who's never come to the end of themselves yet, who've never come to the place where they've just laid their life down for you, where they have surrendered their will to you, I want to pray for them right now, Lord. I, I pray as they acknowledge before you that, that they want to come to that place where they give you full reign of their life. They give you permission to start working in their life. I want to pray for them right now, Lord. That your Holy Spirit would come upon them, Lord. 
I pray, Lord, that as they acknowledge their desire to surrender, that you'd begin to work, Lord. And no matter what the cost, no matter where you may lead them, that they wouldn't put up any resistance, but they, they would just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I pray that now that you would encourage them and bless them and fill them with a peace, Lord. And then finally, Lord, I want to pray for anybody here that doesn't know you, that's not born again, that's not saved. If they were to die today, they would end up in hell forever. I want to pray for them right now. Lord, I pray that you'd begin to just now show them their need for you. And they wouldn't let Satan steal the seed. They wouldn't let Satan distract them. At this moment is the most important moment of their life right now. So if that's you, I'm going to pray this prayer. And this prayer is what I ask you to pray to the Lord after me. Just repeat after me. But you're praying it to the Lord. And it's you praying and asking God to forgive you. That's all it is. That you could be born again. That you can know Him. That your sins would be forgiven. So if that's you, pray this prayer with me out loud to the Lord. Here we go. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And Lord, I now put my faith in you. I believe you rose again from the dead. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And help me to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen.